Voss, artesian water from Norway. Splendidly still or luxuriously sparkling. Voss, artesian water from Norway. Want to learn from Chicago's number one culinary arts school? Kendall College now offers a certificate training program and individual cooking classes. Go to taste.kendall.edu for more information. I got to know Stobe through Alain Ducasse. Getting one for the first time and then cooking with it was a wow moment for me. What sets it apart? The construction and durability of it, the craftsmanship that goes into it, the history that goes into it. I mean, it goes back to Paul Bocuse. It's like the Mercedes-Benz of cookware for me, almost. Introducing Groupon's new bookable, time-based offers. Easily book a reservation at top restaurants right on the Groupon website. All we need is a date, time, and party size. Show up for your reservation time, no voucher required. presents the dinner party. So what I do on the dinner party is I invite three celebs and a known chef who cooks for them. And over food and wine and chocolate and some performances, the conversations flow. And that sounds pretty good. But what's even better than that is that you are having everything that we're having. So tonight, and I can hear you guys already nibbling, so you know what you've got. And you've got chocolate coming your way too, which is pretty good. Okay, so we're all eating together. That's fantastic. But really at a dinner party, what you want is good conversation. So you guys are all gonna join us in the conversation. So this is how it's gonna work. It's kind of something new tonight. For those of you who don't tweet, and I know there's some of you out there, we're gonna go old school. So if you notice, on your table, there's some index cards. So if you want to talk to Ashley Weeder of the Joffrey Ballet, for example, Write your name and your email address on the index card. And as soon as you have a question and you've written it out, raise your hand and one of my fantastic interns running around the room will grab that index card and bring it to my lovely social media director, Allie Drum. So that way, anyone who wants to can ask a question, write it on the index card with their name and email, and it'll get to Allie as soon as you raise your hand. Now, if you want to go 2014, you can pull out your phone and get on Twitter and get your Twitter fingers ready and you can tweet us any question at Dinner Party CHGO. Hashtag the dinner party always helps. Dinner Party CHGO. So, so send us your questions via Twitter or by index card. And you want to do this because we're giving away $100 at Perennial Verant, care of our great friends at Groupon. We've got two tickets to the Joffrey Ballet. We've got CDs, we've got David's tea, we've got great stuff. So you definitely want to tweet or write in your questions to us. But I have to warn you, you are not alone. You have a little bit of competition because we are streaming live tonight on the Chicago Sun-Times Splash website. So you've got some competition. Welcome everybody who's watching tonight on the Sun-Times website. If you know people who couldn't come tonight, but they're at home being boring, you can always tell them chicagosplash.com dinner party. Let them know that they're kind of losers, but they can still watch chicagosplash.com dinner party. Okay, so I'm gonna get everybody, I'm gonna let everyone get familiar with their index cards, and I'm gonna let everyone get their phones ready on Twitter while I thank my sponsors because I love them. So thank you to Groupon. They are just doing the coolest stuff. They have a new site called Groupon Reserve, where Groupon people can go to the site, choose and lock in a time for a reservation before they even buy a deal. It's very cool, Groupon Reserve. I also want to thank Voss Water. You all have water at your tables, these lovely, elegant bottles. The water is so good. They, they're wonderful to work with. Kendall College, the best cooking school in the land. I love to work with them. They have classes for adults and students. They're just great. 
And then, of course, Stope Cookware, they've been wonderful too. We've been working with them. They're giving us all sorts of dishes and plates you'll see tonight. They're, they're just fantastic. Chefs love them. And then finally, Lagunitas Beer, because everybody needs a good beer. And I can see that's why you're all in a good mood, because you've all had some Lagunitas, which is great. So, okay, enough of the details and information. Everyone should know their Twitter, their Twitter accounts by now and their index cards. You should be ready to tweet in. So let me announce my first guest. Born in Scotland, he studied at the Royal Ballet of England. He was named a principal dancer by the age of 20. He's danced with some of the best dancers in the world, including Rudolf Nureyev. He went on to be an artistic, assistant artistic director at the San Francisco Ballet. But what we care about is that he's with us now as our artistic director, the Joffrey Ballet in Chicago. Please welcome Ashley Weider. Have a seat. My next guest basically does everything. She has been nominated for pre-Grammy awards, six of them for her newest album. She's been mentioned as the best rocker, rock star entertainer by Chicago Music Awards. She is also, she has sung the national anthem for Governor Quinn, and she's also sung the national anthem for the female Chicago football team, the Chicago Force. And then after she sings, she goes onto the field and she makes some incredible plays as the quarterback on the female Chicago professional contact team, the Chicago Force. She's won two gold medals for playing world championship football with Team USA, and she's won a national football title for her work with the Chicago Force. I told you she does it all. Football star and music star. Please welcome Sammy Grisafi. is also not a slacker. He's 33 years old, and he's directed 17 features. I'm just coming out. I'm going to wait for you. Great. Good. good. I want to talk about you while you're here. So he sends me this really sort of innocuous bio that says, like, yeah, I've directed some films. But uh, to be clear, 17, or is it 18 now? I have lost count, and that's not a joke. I actually don't know. It's somewhere in that zone. And he's 33, so I'll let you do the math. 17, 18 features, he's 33. Uh, he's also an actor. He's acted in Ty West, The Sacrament, and uh, You're Next, and VHS, lots of scary movies, White Reindeer. But really what's notable is all the movies that he directs. He's so prolific and so talented, which is why he was named number three on the 50 in film in New City. So welcome Joe Swanberg, who's already had seats. <laughs> And then I'm, of course, going to join my guests, but I would be remiss if I didn't again say that we have fabulous chef Paul Verant here from V, Vistro, and Perennial Verant. He is slaving away devilishly for us right now in the kitchen, and he's going to join us soon. So do I have a mic or do I not? Do I need this still? OK, oh, that's great. Thanks. <laughs> Was not sure. It's always touch and go here. So of course, you guys, so as, as you know, for, uh, some people have been here before, and I love you for it. So for those who are coming here for a second or third time, I always have people who don't know each other. And then I find something in common between the three of them. But I'll tell you, the three of you actually have a lot in common. And we're going to get to that in just a second. But first, I have to focus on what I think I care about most at the moment when I'm hungry, which is food. So let's see what Chef is creating for us right now in the kitchen. Hello, I'm Chef Paul Verant from V Perennial Verant in my new restaurant, Vistro. I'm excited about cooking for you folks for the dinner party. We're here today at V, which has been here for just over 10 years. We do a lot of seasonal American cooking with an emphasis on food from around the Midwest and preservation. So today as an appetizer, we're gonna be doing chicken liver mousse with sweet and sour cranberry and some rye toast. So we have chicken livers, butter, cream. At this point, you can use any spices you want. I sort of like fall spices, autumn spices. So we have some mace, some cloves, some ginger, and then for a little heat, and a little smoke, I have smoked paprika. And then we use pink salt, and the pink salt keeps the liver nice and pink. There's a couple ways to do a chicken liver mousse. You can either combine everything raw and bake it. In this case, we're gonna sear them. 
These are gonna cook fast, so you can almost, when the pan is real hot, you can almost turn the heat off, sear them. You just wanna cook these until they're just medium. When you're doing a mousse like this, I think it's important to have some booze in there. Uh, traditionally, you know, a, a French style will have either a cognac or a brandy. Um, in this case today, we're gonna use a nocino, which is a liqueur that we make in house from green black walnuts that we get from a couple blocks right down the road. There we go. Okay, the livers, the livers feel good. Okay, now they're gonna go in a food processor. Okay, and we're gonna blend these. We're gonna get them nice and smooth. Okay. And we're gonna add the butter first. I like to make sure that the butter is incorporated and emulsified into the hot livers first. And then we're gonna finish it with the cream. The cream obviously adds some flavor, adds some body, but it's more of a consistency thing with the cream. We're gonna check it for seasoning. Now, maybe a little dash of salt. When you're seasoning something that's gonna be served cold, you wanna season it a little bit more than you would, because it's gonna be harder to taste that when it's cold. Okay, nicely blended. Now we're gonna, we're gonna strain it through the bowl sieve, and that'll give a nice, smooth texture, okay? So right in the bowl sieve. Obviously the finer the sieve, the smoother it'll be. Make sure we get everything out. Having worked with uh, some French chefs, you never, you never go without your spatula. You gotta get everything out of there. So the, the mousse is done at this point in time. So what I like to do is put it in the vessel that you're gonna serve in. So we're gonna go ahead and pour a few ounces in this stove dish. Now we're gonna put this in the refrigerator until it sets up. Okay folks, so the chicken liver mousse, it's been in the refrigerator for at least an hour. Along with this, I like to have some kind of a preserved fruit item. So for tonight, we're doing the cranberry agridoux, which is a recipe out of my, out of my book, The Preservation Kitchen. Agridoux is French for sweet and sour. It's a combination of red wine, red wine vinegar, honey, and spices. Kind of has a nice, you know, cranberries have a lot of pectin, so there's there's a nice sort of natural sauce. You could serve this alongside. I kind of like to serve it on top of the mousse because it'll allow the, the folks that are having it to kind of get that, that perfect bite as they go down in there in the spoon with the spoon, you get some of the fruit and the mousse. Something like this, you want to make sure you serve it with some crostini or some bread. So we have a rye bread arranged along the side, and we have a nice little appetizer that can be served individually or family style. There you have it. That's the chicken liver mousse with the cranberry agridoux and the rye toast. Thanks for having me here at the dinner party. for you. Yes. How did, so I don't know if you guys know this. You have your book with you, yes? I do, you don't, not, not, with not you, on right it. Okay. Minute, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it out the next week. Yes, okay, that's fair enough. Um, you are known for canning and making preserves and um, making fresh things last for like about a year. And True. I want to know how you got into that because it's such a niche. You know, just growing up in the Midwest, I'm from the St. Louis area and I've, I've been up here since 95 and I think in the Midwest where there's distinctive growing seasons. You know, we've always, I've always kind of taken a, a, a traditional approach to, to food and we do a lot of preservation at the restaurant. So, you know, I was exposed to it a little bit when I was a kid, but you know, both of my, my, my grandmothers did, did some, some pickling and canning and so forth. Um, and I think as a professional cook, you know, I, I always had sort of other hobbies that were different than maybe what my job would entail at the at the restaurants so i was i was into it you know and uh, it just sort of evolved into 
becoming a pretty s signature component of the food. You know, we, we, we try to support a lot, of, a lot of local farmers around the Midwest, and this really enables us to have some of these things that are grown or that are only in, in season at certain times of the year, all year. So. Well, so I love this that you can preserve, as you say in your book, preserve right. preservatives or preserves and um, uh, canning and pickles, and, and that it can last all year long. But one of the reasons I never do it at home is that I always imagine it's a lot of work. To me, it looks like a lot of work. You know, it's. I mean, I think it's like anything. It's you know, with the right instruction, you know, you can you can do it. I mean, it's not that complicated. It doesn't really require a ton of investment. How many, how many canners do we have out in the audience? Any, Is there canners? anybody? Any newbie? Yeah. Really? Yeah. There, I see two. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, obviously I think, you know, I think my, I think my book is a great, a great yes. guy. Yes. But there's, there's a lot of other great books, too. I mean, my, my sort of inspiration, in addition to my, to my family, was old American books, you know? Uh -huh. even, even like The Joy of Cooking has a pretty extensive section on preservation. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, so. one of the things I love about it is, you know, we have one season here that goes on for about seven months that is basically brown. So if you're canning, know, you can, you know, it's really... It's pretty warm out there today. Well, We're yes. Still... Yeah, today, my tomatoes have long been dead. Right. I mean, I mean, we had such a cold summer, you know, so you, can, you just can't rely on getting good fresh things all year long. In a way, if you're counting just the Midwest, you know, of course, if you're flying things in or in sure. other ways. So I love the, the idea that you can make it last all year long, but, you know, I've never really tackled it in my own kitchen. But I do have your book myself. I did buy your book. I think and you so, can rock it out. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tackle that, Miss Winter. Well, okay, I know you're still working on entrees, and yeah. he's gonna belly up to the table and join us later, but um, Everything thanks good for- good so far, folks? Yes, yeah, so good. All right. Thanks, Thank you're you. doing a bit. Thank you. a dream to work with too. Okay, so you guys have a lot in common, but I think what I noticed first about you is that you're all curators in some respect. So of course, Ashley, you decide what goes on for the Joffrey, Absolutely. what you're going to put on. But Sammy, as well as a musician, you decide what kind of music you're going to play and what songs go out there. And then of course, you as a prolific filmmaker, you're always deciding what kind of film you're gonna make. And I'd like to know how each of you decides, I'll start with Ashley, but you know, everyone chime in, how each of you decides how you curate your body of work. Before I let Ashley speak, I will say, from Hedy Weiss, how many people here saw Swan Lake? Okay, from Hedy Weiss of the Chicago Sun-Times, this is Joffrey Ballet production of Christopher Wheeldon's altogether fascinating reimagining of Swan Lake is a monumental achievement on every level and an altogether stunning way to celebrate the company's 20th, 20th anniversary in Chicago. This marks the Joffrey's first ever production of the ballet's most demanding classic in its nearly six decade history and the company met the challenge in a remarkable way. How did you decide to do oh, Swan she's Lake? A tough one too. Do you know, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I took over the company in 2007 mm. and, um, and in 2004, Christopher Wilden choreographed Swan Lake, and I was at the opening with him. And uh, I've worked with Christopher Wilden for, for many, many years uh, in San Francisco. And uh, I think that he's probably the most uh, innovative person in our field today. Yes. He's just a, a choreographic yes. genius. Yes. And so I, I remember saying to him at the opening night, you know, Christopher, I really loved what you've done and telling a story that can reach a wider audience today and be relative. We talk about relativity and being yes, relevant. Sure. And I just thought that his way of telling the story of Swan Lake was so relevant. And I said, you know, I, I don't know if ever, but if I ever have a company, uh, I would love to do it. And then I think that when I took over the Joffrey, there, there's always been a a kind of, a, a, there's a natural uh, journey that I think we all take. Yes. Um, as to when, when is the right time for something. Right, which and was so, my and question. What, and what, do, what happens in the years before that. Yes. So for me, personally, it's a 10 year journey. For the Joffrey, it's been a seven year journey. Um, and I think that it was absolutely the right time with the right dancers in the company. I think that I'm so proud of the dancers yes. and, and the work that they put into Swan Lake. And um, we finished our last performance yesterday. I know, I know. And it, was, it has been the most triumphant 
um, 10 performances it really has been. in the history of the Joffrey Ballet. It is the biggest grossing production that we have ever done outside of the Nutcracker. you guys as well. So you were planning to do Swan Lake long before you actually long did Swan ago. Lake. And do you guys create in the same way? You see a vision for what's going to happen three years down the road with your music or two years down the road with your films? You want me to go? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of it for, for me, is, as far as songwriting goes, it's really selfish in a lot of ways. You know, I'll, I'll feel something and, and I have to get it out of me. It's kind of a therapeutic thing, but actually with the song I'm gonna to play tonight, um, it was a friend of mine who w wanted to get married and uh, she and her partner had been together for a long time and she had mentioned, this was prior to the, the bill signing of marriage equality. She's like, you know, you should write a song about this because I can't tell you how difficult it is to be in love with somebody and not be able to get married. Mm -hmm. And so I went home that night, and there's a couple of songs that have happened like this. A lot of them are very selfish, and they write, you know, from my own experience. But in, that, in this case, um, it was triggered, at least. You know, I end up writing on my own my self experience, but it was triggered by this person who was kind of saying, you know, all I want is to be with my best friend forever. Right. And, right. And. Uh, so that's where that started. I can see where music is very of the moment. You, you're sort of doing it, you know, right then. It's something that takes you emotionally and you go with it, whereas you might plan a season many years out. I'm sure you, the 20th anniversary and Swan Lake aren't a complete coincidence. Right. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, how about for you? You're probably um, in the middle it's somewhere. Well, it's changing these days. I mean, I, I tend to have a pretty short attention span. So most of the movies I've made have come out of if something kicks around for too long, uh, it then has to really change to get exciting again for me. You mean so if you've made a movie and then it sits in editing for No, too long, if I've no. had an idea that oh, it head. takes too long to actually make it, mm -hmm. uh, it then has to go through some metamorphosis and get exciting to me again or uh, take yes. some sort of new shape and then I can sort of dive in. Yes. So I tended to kind of do movies that are relevant to me right at that moment. You know, I've, I've, I've sort of spent some time with a movie and not quite figured it out, and then some other idea pops up, and I'm more likely to just kind of go with that go thing with that. that's happening right yeah. there. But, you know, as, I mean, it's just changing because, you know, I'm sort of coming from outside of the industry. These days I'm more working within the industry, which just moves a lot slower. Yes. And so I'm having to kind of work on my own attention span and also just accept that if I'm gonna do a movie, uh, like at a studio or on sort of a bigger level, that's not gonna be something that I get excited about and then we're shooting it three days later. You know, it's, it's gonna have to be something that uh, goes through a gestation period and goes through a screenwriting period and a casting period and all those other things. So it's, it's shifting. Right. Now I could say that probably, I think it's very realistic that I could have an idea for a movie and I might not actually get to make that for five years. Ooh, God, that's hard. But it's okay because it's there's a, a lot of busyness in the interim. It's not in those five years. I would never spend those five years just sitting there working on that project. It would sort of be happening quietly in the background while I'm doing a lot of other things. Well, so that leads me to an, another question for all of you: in in how do you develop your voice? Because you have a particular thing you want to say, and the outside world, as you're saying, is reaching you with this idea or this impetus, or you've got studio pressures, or you've you know, mentioned your triumphant uh, Swan Lake financially as well as artistically. So you know, you've got these constraints. How do you develop your voice, any or all of you? I think that changes sometimes. I mean, you'll, you'll think that you're on one track. It's like, okay, this is gonna go this way, and then you can get, you know, you can become sideswiped from something that comes in. And that's what's great about collaboration. You're lucky enough to be in an environment that is like that. I mean, for example, if you write a song, I just got out of the studio doing the first two songs that are gonna be on this new album, and I've been playing them live for a while, and then it gets to the point where it's like, oh, we have to cut it, because it has to be radio ah, ready, right. so then I have to cut off a minute and a half, and at first it's like, no, you can't take my song, <laughs> ruin it. Right. Um, but ultimately it ends up being better for the song and then I like it more. So, I mean, that's, I think that 
that can end up sideswiping you and, and where you think you're going, you don't end up like right. life. You know? Right, and right. I think that we were talking be before we came out here about, you know, all of us, or I speak for the yeah. three of us. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> I've known you long enough now that you can speak for me. You can have some drinks backstage. We, we all want uh, collaboration and communication, and I think that they're key, key things. And I would say, you know, for me, I walk in the studio and I have 40 dancers in front of me. Yes. It's a collaboration. Mm -hmm. And it takes every single one of us to believe in the same idea and bring it to the same place. Yes. So your ideas are also formed by those that you're working with. Yeah, and I think that, you know, um, I, I'm not a, you know, there are, there are different times of how we live today. And, and I really believe in having very open conversation with the company and, you know, we're, we're a collaborative force. Yes. It's not, I'm your boss, this is what you should do. It's more a journey of, guys, this is what, what I feel we should be doing and this is where I want to go. And you can, you can see how they feel. And there are people that would say, you know, which happened was, this is too hard. Oh. And I understand that. But I have, a, I have a, a really clear idea about what I feel about the art form of dance and where it should sit. And I think when it's excellent, it's brilliant. When, when you play a great game of football, we know, everyone knows that. People, the world recognizes excellence. Yes. So you actually, because I, I imagine, I know that you do a lot of improv. And many of yeah, your films are all improv. Exclusively, right. Yeah. Which is sort of an amazing way to make a film. And for you, you get to, a lot of it is yourself that you're, you're coming to. Of course, you have collaborators, people that you sing with. But I always imagined behind the scenes at the Joffrey or any major ballet company that it was pretty much dictator all the way down. But you're saying it's much more collaborative yeah, than I that. Yeah, I think it's much more. I think that also the Joffrey is a, is a, rare, it's a rare organization yeah. in, in our art form because it's a very democratic company. We have no ranking. There, are, there is opportunity for everyone at every level. You don't have to have served your time to get a role. If oh. someone is ready for a role in their first year in the company, they're going to dance the role. So that makes it a very competitive environment, I would think. Um, I think it's competitive but supportive. And I think that they realize that, you know, if you want to dance with the Joffrey Ballet, you, you can't say, well, I'm coming here because I want to be a soloist and then a principal. Uh -huh. You say, I want to come here because I believe the work is really, really on, on where I believe the art form is. And I want to be a part of that. That's, that's, re that's really interesting because that's exactly, as far as the football world in my life, that's an absolute, it's cause driven, right? So it's like, it's cause driven leadership. Right. And, that, and that's something that you don't find a lot nowadays, especially right. in a very kind of a self world. Yes. Um, I mean, a couple of my teammates are here actually, and, and I would say, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's called the force. <laughs> what's great about it is, you know, Kelsey, for example, she, she was a, a rookie this year, ended up starting a uh, starting running back for us. So it wasn't so much, oh, well, you've been here. It's who's going to get the job done, who's going to work hard, but most importantly, who's going to put them t the team before themselves um, so that the team can ultimately be in the place that we need to be, not an individual. And that's, that's a hard lesson to learn, and it's, it's beautiful when you can find a, an ensemble. And it's very yeah. rare, which is why I, I said in the beginning that these three really actually have a lot in common, because it's the same with your films. They sort of big name actors come to relatively, let's say speaking, smaller films for the cause. Well, and for a very different experience. I yes. mean, I, what I've found in the film industry is that we, I mean, we're sort of at a point right now where uh, what's getting made is remakes and reboots and sequels and franchises. At best. So Gosh. for a filmmaker like me, it's a really exciting time because a lot of actors are really bored with the options that are on the table and they're willing to come basically lose money to do a movie with me just so that they can act again, you know, yeah. and just so that they're not playing like a superhero. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's exciting. I mean, you yeah. know, it's like uh, that, that balance ends up finding itself anyway, you know. Yes, and we're right. talking about people who have reached a point in their career where they have plenty of money. So they're no longer 
Now they're looking for artistic satisfaction. They're not looking for a paycheck. Wow, they sort so of already paid those dues. What a great and place to be as a director. What a great well, place really to nice. have yeah. them. When yes. I, when I, yeah, I'm yes. able to work with them. It's amazing. Yes, because you've worked with Anna Kendrick and Orlando Bloom and... Uh, yeah, some, he's some, in the new one. He's yeah. in the, yes. When is your new movie coming out? Sometime next year. I mean, yeah. I'm finishing it right now. It's a, it's a little out of my control, but yeah. uh, I'll, I'll take it to festivals next year and try and sell it, and then some distributor will decide when it comes out. But. Well, well, we'll come back to the festival funding portion of this conversation, <laughs> because I know that's a big thing. I mean, how much money can you make playing football or you know, dancing in ballet. Absolutely. So, I mean, depending, maybe you can and maybe you can't. So it's it's an interesting question. But I also have a tweet here, I am told, from my lovely social media director, Ali Drum. Ali, tell me what we've got. Maybe. There yes. you go. Uh, this one is for Ashley. How much was the, how was your transition from performer to director choreographer? Hmm. And I'll just say that that person, do we know who that person is? Uh, C. Thorin. C. Thorne has won two tickets to the Nutcracker at the Joffrey Ballet. Lucky, lucky you. Excellent. Lucky, lucky you. Um, you know, I, I, it's a hard one because I, 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 first of all, I feel incredibly blessed that I had an amazing career. Yes. And the people that I worked with and danced with and that uh, nurtured me. Um, but actually, uh, towards the end, in, in my mid-30s, I was 36 at the time, I was working on a new work and I had a, a really kind of ridiculous but terrible uh, injury from being asked to do something that was totally insane. Oh. And what ended, uh, oh. to cut a really long story short, because we don't, we don't have all night here. Uh, <laughs> well, I that, bet everybody would drink with you and listen, so. <laughs> but I, I ended up rupturing every d disc in my neck. And, oh my um, God. And over a certain amount of eight months, my body started to shut down. I was getting spinal cord damage, and, I, and it was pretty bad. And so uh, I had a lot of tests done, and it was decided that they had to remove three of those discs and cut out some of my vertebra. And uh, they, you know, they did ama amazing uh, surgery. Wow. But it was really, you know, this is it. You, you cannot dance again. Yeah. And, and the director of the San Francisco Ballet, Helgi Thomason, um, who I had worked with for many years, said, you know, actually, whatever happens, you need to know that you have so much more to give the art form and that I have a, I have a job for you and I want you to stay here in San Francisco. Oh. And that was a really extraordinary thing when you, when you really don't know what's going to happen. So I went through the surgery and I had two years of uh, rehab, which was, uh, I had amazing people, amazing doctor. Yeah. And um, it's, it's pretty good. Well, so that probably mm. informed also how you've gone on to direct others, it because you had that great yes. mentor. And I think that, you know, I should, have, I should have at the time put my hand up and said, hey, wait a minute, right. this, I don't feel good about this. Ah. And I think that everyone that I've ever worked with after that, I've always said to people, guys, if you're not comfortable, put your hand up. Right, right, right. Yeah, otherwise, yeah. devastating things can happen. <laughs> but uh, beautiful things can also happen. So let's take a peek and see. I think we have a clip here from Romeo and Juliet. Yes, this is a new production that we did this year. It's by Christophe Pasteur. Uh, it's uh, fantastic. It was a, a really tour de force for the company en masse. So I think that we're seeing uh, the first fight between the Montagues and the Capulets with uh, Lord uh, Capulet and Romeo. Okay, so let's take a <clears throat> peek at Romeo and Juliet.
the, what's really interesting about this version of Romeo and Juliet, it's set in the, in the 1930s and the 50s and then today. And so the, the idea is the story of Romeo and Juliet is it, it's always going to be in our lives and, and conflict is always going to be in our lives. And I think that there were just so many amazing things about the entire production. So it was another um, blockbuster hit for us. So that was really, really wonderful. Well, so it, it, it sort of leads to a question for all of you. You know, the Joffrey, of course, didn't start in Chicago. So why Chicago? Why that move? And then I think both of you are between L.A. and Chicago all the time. So I'd love to hear why Chicago for the three of you. I think for the Joffrey, you know, the Joffrey started in New York. And, it, and, and what's amazing, actually, is that when the company was really a fledgling company, um, there was a wonderful man, Bruce Sagan, who bought the Joffrey to Chicago. And it started a long relationship. And actually, I, w I was dancing in the Joffrey. Um, we were actually performing at the Civic Opera House the night that Robert Joffrey died. And it was just a, a really poignant, poignant moment. I've always remembered that. But when the company was struggling in New York, there were many people who had really been supporters of the company. Uh, Barbara and David Kipper, many, many other people, and they had a they had a meeting and said, "What are we going to do about the Joffrey?" And they realized that Chicago and the Joffrey could be a really great fit, and so they they made it happen. And I think also we have to thank Mayor Daly and Maggie of course. Daly. Of course, uh, there are, there are amazing people in the city that that took on the Joffrey, um, debts and all, yes, and said, yeah. you know, we, we are going to make it succeed, and uh, it's not going to fail on our, on our turf. Yes. And I think that, uh, I think all of us owe the people of Chicago a huge uh, gratitude for, for really keeping the company alive. And I think the company today is thriving, which is fantastic. Yes, and in dance to be thriving. And our current mayor, of course, is such a dance he, aficionado. He yes. was at Swan Lake last week, so. Yeah, of course he was. He enjoyed it very much. Yes. And I think also the, the thing that seems uh, so right about the Joffrey is that it, it truly is an American company. Mm -hmm. It's not a George Balanchine New York City right. Ballet. It's not a great old 19th century classical ballet company. It's always kind of held the current events and, and been a reflection of, of, of the history of America. And so it seems that in this, what I consider the most American of cities, I was just going to say that. It I mean, just that's a nice seems fit. so, so right. Yes, no, that's a very nice fit. It's funny because we were also talking about this backstage, how Chicago, there's such camaraderie here and people are so supportive and really get behind. So I know you as a filmmaker continue to shoot here. I try to. I mean, uh, you know, there's realities to the film industry, and especially these days, most companies are chasing tax incentives. And sure. There's, um, there's just a lot of reasons why films are being made in places like Atlanta and uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, yeah, and other places right. like that, yeah. which are just cheap to shoot. Um, but, you know, with my own work, uh, yeah, I mean, I live here, my family's here, I right. want to work here, so yeah. it's been uh, certainly a priority of mine to write my movies to be set in Chicago and to attempt to shoot them here as much as possible. And also living here is really, you know, I mean, it's a little confusing to people why I don't live in Los Angeles, but... Um, we know why. Who would want to live in Los Angeles? Well, it's a nice place. I mean, I... Uh, all that driving and... It's well, that's a, it, true. It's a disconnected place for me, but... Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, certainly, the times when I'm there, like, trying to get somewhere at 5 p.m. Oh, why would you uh, do it? Why would you do I it? Don't, yeah. 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 I don't want to live there. No. Yeah, of um, but, you know, there's like something really to be said for living outside of the industry, which has been always a big part of what's exciting. You know, Chicago has plenty going on. We get to, you right. know, I feel like I have all the uh, advantages of living in a major city and none of the disadvantages of living sort of within striking distance of the industry. But, you know, I would say these days the biggest thing Chicago has going for it in terms of just like my day-to-day -day work life is that I don't have to take meetings while I'm here because 
<laughs> sounds like a minor thing, but and actually your whole thing. life can get suddenly eaten up by meetings if you're uh, living in Los Angeles. And, you know, there's a lot of people there. There's a lot of potential for work. And so I think, you know, you can suddenly, years can go by and you can realize that all you did that whole time was just meet with people and talk about making things. Potentially making and things. And living in Chicago yeah. for me has been almost exclusively about actually making those mm -hmm. things. So I, I had, you might know him, Nick Bowling, who's the associate director, I love this quote, he's the associate director of the Timeline Theater. He always says, well, in New York and LA, you have to focus on the hits. And when you focus on the hits, it can take away from the work. But in Chicago, you focus on the work, and that can make for better work. And so things are actually getting made here, as opposed to just yeah. talking about things getting made here. And it, it, it goes back to what we were saying before about finding your voice. I would think it would be very hard to have a voice in LA, because there'd be so much pressure coming from other areas. Here, as kind of a lone wolf, you really have a voice, I'm guessing. In terms of finding my voice, I mean, in terms of finding a voice in general, I feel like the only way you do that is by working as much as you can. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, I mean, we're living, for film, I'll speak just specifically for film. I mean, we're living particularly in a time where it's become cheaper and easier to make movies than it ever has been. Everybody so, makes movies. Wherever you live. How many people live? in the audience make their own movies? People, you're kidding. Wow. Well, my nephew makes his own movies. I mean, yeah. that makes your own movies. Check them out. It's really, um, you know, the hurdle used to be just raising the money to buy the film. And, you know, there used to be a barrier to entry that's happened a lot earlier. And so now, sure. it, you know, it's easier to make the work. It's harder to get people to see the work because there's so many yes. movies now. So, yeah. um, it's really, you know, it's like been a nice thing to live here and to be able to focus on the work. And I found that. Uh, you know, your voice, in a way, like, you can have as many grandiose ideas at the beginning of your career as you want about what, you know, what you hope to do or what you will accomplish. But, you know, your voice just ends up being the thing that happens after you make a lot of work. And so right. I've always just focused on trying to get the movies made. And then in a way, like, my voice has found me as much through what I was able to make and now, like 10 years into my career, it's like, oh, well, that's my voice. But really, it was just... They're all along. I don't know. It just happened. It was just <laughs> like, these were the movies I could get made at that particular moment. These were the people I happened to be collaborating with. And that all informed it. And now, whatever I would say my voice was is a byproduct of the work. Yes. Rather than something that was inherent to me mm, from absolutely. the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, because now as you get more commercial, and you're not commercial in the negative sense, but now as your movies are bigger productions, yeah. fair enough to say. Um, you're lucky that you had all that smaller work behind I you feel lucky. so that you could yeah. keep that I really voice do feel that is lucky. your own. Yeah. So I, I have a question that is a bit of a segue, but also that plays off of this, and I hope this question is taken in the right sense. So you've done a lot of movies that have really strong female characters. Mm -hmm. And Ashley, you know, I, I don't know how it was growing up in Scotland saying that you wanted to be a ballet dancer. Mm. I don't know if it was like Billy Elliot. It was. How, it was <laughs> like Billy Elliot. And for Sammy, I don't know what it was like growing up as a girl saying, well, I'm going to play football. But I'm going to ask the question to all of you and answer it in any order that you want. Does gender matter anymore? Hmm. I would say uh, it depends. I, I think a little bit still in dance. I think that there's a little bit of a stigma um, I would say in America probably more than Europe. Really? Yes. I think that in huh. Europe, I think that the idea of, of sport and culture, they seem very hand in hand. And I think that That's the nice. idea of a boy wanting to be a top athlete, because I think that that's the thing, that we, we are athletes. Absolutely. You know, Dancers the, are athletes, at yes. At the highest level. Yes, yes, agreed, um, yes, of course. And, uh, and I think that it's kind of, it's changing, but I think there's still a stigma there. What would you say, Sammy? I would say we're seeing a change. I think we're in the middle of a change. We were just talking prior to coming up here, and there's a lot of things that are changing right now. We're in the midst of a, a revolution, I think. Our, we um, being football or? Society, I mm -hmm. think, in general. Um, but, but definitely, as far as the, the, the gender thing goes, I mean, when I was a little girl, 
there was no, there, there was one depiction of a, a female quarterback and it was the 1982 made for TV movie with Helen Hunt. So, I mean, <laughs> that was the only thing I saw that was, that had anything to do with what I dreamed about. I mean, when I, my best friend when I was a kid asked me, what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I said a man so that I could play Major League Baseball. You know, like, and it had nothing to do with gender identity. I just wanted, wanted to play Major League Baseball, right. and there was yes. only men playing it. So um, I think that that's changing a lot. I mean, and now it's really exciting to see people like Monet Davis, who's, you know, pitching, and, and all of these young women every week. There's an article about an, another girl that's playing football at a high school level, and, you know, doing that 11 years, oh, I guess, well, 13 years ago. Um, it was scary. Yeah, but sure. I feel lucky because I wasn't the first even. I mean, I was a trailblazer in the sense at that time. But, you know, I just found out about this film that's being made that I'm going to fight tooth and nail to get into. It's called The Toledo Troopers, or A Perfect Season, and it's about a 1970s women's team, uh -huh. which is the most winning, winningest football team in all of football history. Really? Yeah, they won like 10 seasons in a row. Um, it's called the perfect season, and and these women, I mean, were the true trailblazers, and and to see all of this happening now and unfolding, I mean, we're in a huge changing time. Yeah. Yes. And it's wonderful. I think it's really great. Yes. Not to say that we should wash away tradition and all of that. I think that that's very important and beautiful, um, but I do think it's wonderful as far as a quality standpoint. I'm just... Well, so I have another question for you. Again, I hope taken in the right way because. It probably wasn't easy growing up, and also maybe for you. Do you ever wish you were someone else? And the reason I ask this question is because I think a lot of people look at you and think like, oh gosh, I wish I were Joe Swanberg. He's making movies, he's getting them made. Somehow he gets them funded. We'll come to that later because we're not really sure how it happens. Oh gosh. And then I wonder if you ever think, I wish I were Steven Spielberg. So, I mean, I think a lot of people look at the three of you trailblazing and think like, oh my gosh, I wish I were as powerful as them, or as creative, or as fearless. And then I wonder if you all think like, oh, if only I were Baryshnikov, my life would be so much easier. I mean, the, no, is the I, you know, I adore Baryshnikov. He's a wonderful man. And I have to say, he's, he's been a, a, good, a good supporter to me and a very good friend, and as was Rudolf Nureyev. And I think that they, they were really two of the, of the greats. They, they actually, both of them, I think Rudolf and Baryshnikov, they, they changed the idea about a male dancer. Uh, yes, You right. know, I think that they broke a lot of stigma. Yes, you yes. Know, they, they turned it on, they got up there, they, they did amazing things. And I think people looked at them and went, wow, that's, that, that, takes, that takes balls. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and from a yeah. marketing kind of standpoint, uh, Barishnikov, I thought, did so much just to open up people yeah. to dance and that how Athletically demanding. Yeah, he it realized is. that right. he realized that Hollywood was a massive yes. way to reach people, yes. and so you know when he did White Nights with yes. Gregory Hines, yes. And, yes. which you know, just replayed at the Chicago uh, International Film Festival, it was yeah. just closed last week. You know, it yeah. was a way to reach masses of people. Yeah, yeah, so smart. We He's have a tweet smart. for Sammy, so maybe um, Ali Drum can let us know what somebody wants to ask Sammy. If her mic's on. Yep. <laughs> From Chuck Stefner, who has inspired your work the most? Ooh, so I will tell Chuck that he has won a CD and tickets to your next show, which is at Martyrs. On November 6th, yeah. November 6th. Come on, Great. Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a good question. <laughs> well, as far as, as far as sports goes, I've really been inspired Actually, both sports and music, I've been inspired by the people around me um, in both aspects. So when I was a little girl, I got lucky that I was given the chance to fail by my parents. That's what they were hoping for. They didn't want me to be a girl football player, and neither did my coaches. Ah, neither, neither did, did anybody. So really, I mean, but they gave me the opportunity. And right. when they found out how much I loved it, they were very supportive. So I'm... I guess the people that have inspired me the most, I've had a lot of great mentors, and it's very important, I think, in everybody's life, especially young people, to know that somebody's in your corner for yeah. you, mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, and to not get discouraged, because <laughs> believe me, there is a lot of times in both the industries that my heart has chosen me to go for, 
they're not easy. Um, right. There's no money in women's sports. There's barely any money in music. But um, but I have to do it, and I'm lucky that I have friends and family members and people who are always saying, you're not quitting because this is who you are. And so really, it's it's the people in my life. That's that's where I feel the luckiest, and I, I wouldn't want to be anybody else in the world because yes. of the yes. support system I have, and I'm very grateful. So we've been talking a lot about Football, female football. You've been seeing some of the pictures up there. You're, you're I have to say, a beautiful football player, by Thank the way. You. There's that one gorgeous picture, and she's running, really just a, a beautiful football player. But you also sing. And so Chuck won some tickets to hear you sing, and the rest of us would also like to know. So how would you feel about playing your ukulele and singing? Absolutely, yes. And yeah. you are going to be met by... I'd like yeah, my best friend, actually. My, my college roommate comes. and very talented best friend is going to join me, Lindsay Wonderful. And what's the name of the song that we're going to sing? And I think there's a little bit of a background story to it, yes? Yeah, so this is, um, this is the song I was just telling you guys about. It's called Brand New Fairy Tale. So this is a lot about growing up, and to Chuck's tweet, um, not seeing your fairy tale written in fairy tale books. You know, like I'd always look at these stories and... And I'd say, oh, um, I want to be the knight in shining armor. I don't want to necessarily be the princess, because the princess just has to sit in a tower and wait for somebody. <laughs> and like the, the knight in shining armor gets a sword, which is cool. <laughs> so like, to, with all joking aside, I really wanted to have a, I had a different view of what my fairy tale was. And then it was inspired or triggered by my friend who wanted to get married and couldn't. So it's about writing your own fairy tale. And in this world right now, I think that we're living in, I think that's very probable. I think that's where progress stems from. And uh, so yeah, this is my friend Lindsay Wah. No, it's OK. We're going cash. Let me just tune up real fast, make sure I'm, I'm all good. It's a ukulele. <laughs> you guessed right. Won't somebody write this down? I got dreams that I gotta say are represented very well.
fairy tale. party setting and then performing. It took me a minute to get in the groove, I apologize. Everybody. I think we have a sponsor. Next thing you know. Don't we our sponsors? I think our sponsor. There we go. Quick word from our sponsors. We're gonna be right back. Voss, artesian water from Norway. Splendidly still or luxuriously sparkling. Voss, artesian water from Norway. Want to learn from Chicago's number one culinary arts school? Kendall College now offers a certificate training program and individual cooking classes. Go to taste.kendall.edu for more information. I got to know Stobe through Alain Ducasse. Getting one for the first time and then cooking with it was a wow moment for me. What sets it apart? The construction and durability of it, the craftsmanship that goes into it, the history that goes into it. I mean, it goes back to Paul Bocuse. It's like the Mercedes-Benz of cookware for me almost. Introducing Groupon's new bookable, time-based offers. Easily book a reservation at top restaurants right on the Groupon website. All we need is a date, time, and party size. Show up for your reservation time, no voucher required.
Awards, we are back. Ashley Weider, our artistic director of the Joffrey Ballet. And we have Sammy Grisavi, who just sang a wonderful song for us, football player. And, and we have uh, director Joe Swanberg, who decided to go to the bathroom. He but, you know, in somewhere. theory, he's coming back. So I want to take this moment to say something really important. Um, Windy City Times does, we were talking about this, but love them. Love them. They do such an important job. They're also a media sponsor of ours. They do such an important job. Tracy Bain, we were talking about this behind. Yes, yeah, she's just so important, I think. She's such a beautiful asset to our city, and she has done so much for the Marriage Equality Act, and just she's a beautiful person, and I love Windy City Times, and, um, and Joe Swanberg is back. So, <laughs> uh, great. Yeah, if I could just say, I mean, a lot of people don't know this about Tracy Bayman in particular, but also Windy City Times. I mean, so I was I was lucky enough. Uh, my company was able to run the the stage for the March for Marriage Equality, which Tracy Bayman and Windy City Media organized all of that. Pretty simple. And she, she's she's a woman that's very humble, and but everybody oh in the gosh. community, especially in Chicago, um, should know about this woman because she's done great work and and really um, been a voice for progress in in the community of Chicago in general. But especially the LGBTQ yeah. community, so yeah. really wonderful. And person. it's such a Chicagoan because you know Chicagoans are givers. You know, you you find in other cities often this competitive. We don't want to share creatively mm -hmm. or artistically, and Chicagoans don't do that. They they get down and they Love share. Lovers. And she really is a, a beautiful, beautiful person. Absolutely. Um, so we've been dancing around, for lack of a better expression, we've been dancing around funding and how hard it is to get funding. So I will quote again: Hedy White, Chicago Sun Times. The NFL draft is displacing the Joffrey from its auditorium home this spring. I don't know if you guys knew that, but the NFL draft is coming here to Chicago in the Auditorium Theater. They're displacing the Joffrey Ballet from its auditorium home this spring. So it would only be fair if the monumentally overpaid athletes of football <laughs> paid homage to the woefully underpaid athletes of ballet with a very large check. Now, something tells me that the NFL... NFL is not writing you a check. And the NFL could write you a check, we're not sure. But I'm 100% sure mine. that <laughs> the NFL is not writing Joe Swanberg a check. So I would like to know, how does someone at 33, who, who I'll just assume isn't independently wealthy, how does that person fund 17 feature films? Uh, well, you make a lot of them very cheaply. Okay. <laughs> Is that sort of, do you want to talk about Mumblecore movement at all? Who knows what the Mumblecore movement is? No. Oh, look at that. Oh, great. Well, there's one person. Okay, well, do you want to talk um, about the Well, movement? sure. Yeah, it was kind of, uh, I mean, that word Mumblecore was sort of a, w one of those stories of an insular joke that accidentally became, became the thing it was called. Um, but my first movie started playing around in 2005, and it just so happened that, you know, I mean, I, I feel like I'm the product of my time and, uh, you know, cheap editing software, cheap digital video cameras. A lot of things happened during that late 90s, early 2000s yes, period right. when I was in film school. And so I kind of came out of film school and started making films in a world where other, other young people from all around the country were doing the same thing. And, um, the South by Southwest Film Festival in Austin, Texas sort of became the central hub for, there was a programmer there, Matt Dentler, and in turn, I feel like your first question was about curation and programming. Yes. In terms of how important that could be, uh, this one programmer at one film festival in Austin, Texas sort of single-handedly uh, launched, you know, several careers by, right, being, yes. by being tuned into this particular thing we were doing. And not only that, but introduced us to each other, which is another big part of curation. You know, like I understand as a, because that's what I do on this show. Yeah, so absolutely. And now the, these three are sort of thick as thieves, and yeah. they, honestly, <laughs> quite op opposites, and they've become very close. So yeah, you sort of you, you know you're making your work, and you sort of feel isolated and in your own kind of bubble. And then for me, film festivals have kind of been always an atmosphere where I get to see other people's work, I get to meet other people who are doing the same thing or doing different things, and so mumblecore kind of became this umbrella term that encompassed uh, a pretty interesting variety of very low budget, mostly improvised American independent films. Right. Which have been, you know, people have been making those for forever. And 
there's been a business of it since at least the 1960s mm. in America. But, you know, it's really the internet became a tool that at least allowed us to get to know each other from across state lines and often from other sides of the country and also became a way for us, you know, as very low budget filmmakers to start figuring out how we could help each other. For instance, if I was wrapping up a film and, and a friend of mine was shooting somewhere else, I could take the microphones we used and right. FedEx them you over to them yes. for their shoot. And oh, you know, nice. there's just all, yeah. all these other like little bits of equipment that started getting passed around. Yeah. Everybody forgot who owned the equipment. It just sort of um, became this shared kind of thing. And so these Mumblecore yeah. movies were, um, in a way, it's sort of been called the Mumblecore movement, but I don't think it's right. Like, it was never... A movement, to me, feels like there's a manifesto written and there's kind of an, I, an ideology attached to it. Mm -hmm. It really was a community of people, and it was um, just an attempt... I think all of us were interested in realism. We just mm -hmm. wanted to make movies. A lot like what your song is about. Yeah. We weren't seeing our stories being told. And so when I turned on the TV and when I went to see movies, I wasn't really seeing characters that were dealing with things I was dealing with, so I started making movies about that, and simultaneously a lot of other people were too, and we kind of recognized each other well, in that work. What's amazing to me is that through this body of work that you've made, I believe I read somewhere that you are now basically living off of iTunes and video on demand. Well, that that's the other big piece of incredible. technology lately that sort of filled... It's been interesting in film because you you sort of find uh, revenue streams, for lack of a better word, appearing and then disappearing over the decades. You know, so in the 1980s, home video didn't exist, and then suddenly right. it existed, yes, and suddenly yes. these studios had this incredible new source of revenue Just in time. for movies they had already made. Yes, you know, it was right. like, oh, yeah. cool, we can put this on VHS and start renting it out, and. Then that became complicated. Right as my career was starting, uh, DVD sales took a dramatic dip. There was a period of time where DVD was also an incredibly new, lucrative way for movies to make money. And then uh, around the mid-2000s, people, I think because of confusion over Blu-ray and streaming and what was going to be next, people stopped buying DVDs. Mm -hmm. And that stream went away. But then iTunes and some, several other companies stepped in, and now yeah. suddenly there was... VOD or like digital rentals and so I'm catching that wave right now which I'm sure will also disappear in a couple of years and then something else will take its place. But it's amazing that you are actually living off it and you have a house and a baby and you're continuing to make films and you've been able to sort of well, catapult yourself yeah. in this crafty kind of financial well, way. Well I'm living off wonderful. of my catalog too. I made a lot of work. Right, you've and made so a lot of work. None of those movies are making very much money, but the accumulation of all of those movies together starts to look like a living. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. It's your it's the timing is great, but also the craftiness is great. You just made your work money be damned and yes. you've sort of so it's very rare that I have people up here who don't have a PR agent. It's very rare that people respond to me personally. But you are keeping your expenses so low. Every email I get it's is about, I mean, this is like, these are people I don't want to have to manage. As like, well, I, don't, I understand it. For me, getting an assistant would just require a lot of work on my part of teaching that assistant how to be my assistant. How to be it's just guys. easier for me to just do it. So we have a tweet for you. Allie, let us know what this person is asking. All right, from Hank Green, 2013. What is the advantage to the improvisation in your movies versus sticking to a strict script? Ooh, I like that. So, some of that question again. What is the advantage to improvisation in your movies versus sticking to a st strict script? And I will say that that person has won. Allie, can you show people? This is a vinyl. Drinking Buddies, the vinyl edition. It's the sound, soundtrack. The yeah. soundtrack on vinyl. A record. To his yeah, a record. <laughs> to his most famous movie, Drinking Buddies. And that person has won um, a CD from the Sissy Santana band, because they were awesome, right? The opening band, Sissy Santana band. And that person has won David's Tea. All three things. That person Damn. is very lucky. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, there are a few advantages. There are some disadvantages too, which I'll go ahead and talk about as well. Um, okay. Amongst the advantages, 
uh, improvisation allows, has allowed me and continues to allow me to be very flexible. I can, because I'm an independent filmmaker, because I'm making movies for almost no money, I can show up in a situation and make the best of what's actually available to me, as opposed to having a script that's, um, you know, a well-written script uh, pays off over the course of the sure. production, and and it's you know it's a very different art yeah. form. You're sort of uh, suggesting things early on that the audience is not going to fully understand until later, and you know there's a lot of pieces in there that need to work together that become very very difficult to do with no money because you're not sure three days from now whether you're still going to be shooting a movie or not, and right. so it's hard yes. to hint at yes. something yes. that. Yes. Yeah. ends up evaporating, you know, yes. you, you need some location that you end up not being able to get. Um, so the improvisation has certainly allowed me to just continue to work and to kind of work with what I have access to. Um, it's also just lent a level of, of realism to all of the movies, you know. I'm, sure. I'm working with people who I'm asking them to bring a lot of their own life experience to the project and by allowing them to speak with their own voice, uh, I feel like I'm allowing them to be their best. Yeah. I'm not asking them to read dialogue that I wrote. I'm right. asking them to really share with me how they're feeling in that moment. And so that's been really fun. The disadvantage is a really well-written script pays things off over the course of the movie. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it's a way of working that I've found incredibly freeing and, and occasionally limiting because you can only do so much foreshadowing when you're not sure how your movie's going to Where it's end. going, right, <laughs> yes, yeah. So right. So it's been interesting. So, you know, in the 10 years that I've been making movies, I've really attempted to find the right balance between improvisation and script, or between improvisation and outline, at the very least, because I am interested in being a storyteller, and I am interested in taking the audience on a journey, and so... Improv has been a tool that I've cons consistently used, but also I really am trying to become better as a writer as well, so that it's a crafted story and it's not just happenstance, it's not just what we had access to at the time. Well, so let's see your clip, Drinking Buddies, so that everybody gets a feel of just how improvisational his films are, and yet there was clearly a direction going on. So I think we have a clip from his most famous movie, oh, Drinking Buddies. Good. It's a personality thing. I would advise someone in a reverse situation oh, to give you more him. rope, Bad but you shouldn't. Two shots of Malort. Uh, no. Right from the basement. Go on. I'm not drinking Malort. You're gonna yeah, have you a shot. Have to. It's a Chicago tradition. You're single. This will erase all I'm past single. mistakes. It does. It makes room for oh new ones. Oh my god. Here we go. It's like swallowing a burnt condom full of gas. Ah. Oh. Oh. Ah. There you go. Weird oh, form. Oh, Yes. Why? Damn heater. Yeah. Uh oh. There she is. Up top. Hey. Oh. Hey. You okay? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good though. Sure. Yeah. It's. I'm young. You know? <laughs> of course. Here you go. Don't hold me down. No. Yeah. You can't hold me back. Hey. Come outside with me. Let's have a cigarette talk. No, I'm gonna see you inside. I'm gonna play games. Hey, get out here. Let's have no. one second. I want to hear what happened. Come back soon. You're the prettiest girl at work. I'm the only girl at work. You still, still, you still are the prettiest. You could have been the ugliest girl at work and still been the only one. You're not. I've been ten minutes out since I got here. I had one of these and I said I'm gonna have one of those and then. Here I am. Yeah. It's hard once it starts going in. I don't know what I am. Four or five in? You're five in? I might have. Oh. But I had a turkey burger right there, so. You really keep that together. I think we're having a bit too much fun for Chef not to be here. Let's take a quick peek at what he did for our entrees to be so fantastic and belly up to the bar with Chef here. Okay, folks, we're back. So now we're going to do the entree. So I have a Russian Waters trout that we're gonna pan sear. We're gonna serve that with creamed roasted beets. And then we have a little vinaigrette that we're making with fresh bacon, horseradish, dill, and some lemon juice. When I think about a dish, I think about what's the order. So the beets have to be roasted, which I already have. Um, I would say the next step would be to make the vinaigrette. Let's turn a pan on right here. 
Okay, we're gonna cut a chunk of bacon off. We're gonna render the fat. Who doesn't like bacon fat, right? So we're gonna use the fat in the vinaigrette. Now in this case, so I'm using bacon. You could use a pancetta. You could use some other cured meat scraps like prosciutto, ends. Okay, so we're gonna add that to the pan. Okay, you hear that nice sizzle? Okay, now while that's going, we're gonna get our onion. This is an onion, it's called a candy onion. It's a popular onion that's grown around the Midwest. That's a sweet onion. And we had, you know, we had a lot of rain this year, so we had a, we had a, it was a great year for onions. Once the bacon is nice and crisp, you can add the onion. Okay, we're gonna let that kind of slowly sweat. We're gonna add some kosher salt, okay? Kosher salt and fresh black pepper. I have a lemon here. Any citrus, like if you really want to get maximum juice, like if you give it a good roll, just to kind of soften it up a little bit, it'll help. I like to use the whole fruit, so we're going to use the, the zest, which has got all the, the nice oils from the lemon. So let's take the bacon and the onion mixture. All right, we're going to scrape that into this bowl and finish the relish. Now at this point in time, we need some horseradish, two tablespoons, generous amount of this stuff. Mix that in there, and then we're gonna chop up some dill, nice amount of dill. That can sit aside. Now for the beets, we're gonna start the beets in a little bit of butter, not much. This is very simple, choga beets. Add a little butter, creme fraiche, beets, a little seasoning. So I'm gonna add some parsley and some dill. Okay, so now we're gonna cook the trout. The pan is nice and hot. We're gonna do just a little salt, kosher salt on each side. All right, trout's gonna go right in, skin side down. And then add a little bit of butter to the pan, which you wouldn't have to do, but butter's good. So this is a method or a technique called poile, where you're basting something with butter. So we're going to start to organize our plate. We have a nice dish here that was provided by Stove. Okay, so the fish is going to come out. Now we're going to go right into the dish. Okay. Nice piece of trout down. And then we're going to strew the beets over the fish. So we're going to put the last little bit of the beets on there with all the fresh parsley and the dill. Okay. And then we have our horseradish, bacon, lemon, and dill vinaigrette that we're just gonna spoon over the other way. There you have it. This is your entree, the Rushing Waters Trout with the horseradish, dill, bacon, the vinaigrette, and the creamed candy striped beets. Folks, thanks for having me. It was great to cook for you at the dinner party. Get a chance, come out and visit V in Western Springs, Vistro, my new place in Hinsdale, and Perennial Verant in Old Town, and check out my book, the Preservation Kitchen. It's all about the craft of preserving fruits and vegetables and what to do with those wonderful jars. Thank you. I get to sit up here with you, with you folks. Yes, yeah. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. Sit with you. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks yes. Cheers. Food. Absolutely. Yeah. Cheers to our chef. Absolutely. Oh. Oh, yeah. I, I, oh yes. To us and I yeah, oh, yes. No, yes. Oh, wait, I contact. Otherwise, bad luck. I contact. No yes. Absolutely. No bad luck. Cheers. cheers. Oh everybody. yes. Yes. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody. Social. Okay. <laughs> so I would like to start with Chef, but talk to all of you actually about you're so committed. What kind of organizational skills do you have to have to get what you get done? So you have a restaurant in Chicago, a restaurant in Hinsdale, and a restaurant in Western Springs, Illinois. So talk to me about time management. Oh, I should say, and two children. Two kids. Wow. Yes. You know, it's, it, it has a lot to do with having, having good staff. Mm. You know, because obviously I, I'm not, I can't be at every place 
all the time. Sure. So it's about having good staff, good good people that you know that, that I've trained or that have, have worked with me for hopefully quite some time. Yes. And are and are loyal and dedicated to the cause. And that's how you do it. You know? Well, you I, so we did this shoot, of course, and he is so incredibly organized. So it kind of runs the gamut with the chefs, like who's organized and who's not. But you are on the ball, really. I've sort of never Thank seen you. anything like it, actually. I so, don't feel like I'm that. I, I mean, I don't think I'm any more organized than other people. Oh. You know? Oh well, I experienced you as quite organized. <laughs> it does. I mean, I think. I mean, I think cooking or running a restaurant does require a lot of planning. You know, and you and you do have to be organized. I mean, obviously, at, at, at some point in time, you're going to commit to opening. You know, at, at whatever time of the day you're going to open up, you got to be ready to go. But what about so. for the rest of you? Time management. I mean, how are do are you do book your life by every ten minutes? Time is money. Yes, right. We're back to funding. Yes. And uh, <laughs> you know, being being the performing arts, you know, every hour in a theatre is. A huge amount of money. Right. So how you use that time? So yes. it, it's it's exactly the same. You have to manage your time, but but I would I would also agree that having a great team. It's a team. Yes, it has it's to be. Really a team. Yes, right. Yeah, I always find that it's amazing when you get to this stage of the dinner party because I do this every month. How much in common the chefs have with the other arts in terms of. Organizing a team, inspiring a team, getting people to work together, that collaborative effort. What about for you in time management? Because you, again, a small baby at home. Yeah, it's, you know, I work from home, which has allowed me to be a little more flexible with that. My wife's a filmmaker as well, so we, she just shot a movie, so I just spent the last two months being a full-time dad, which was really great, great because yeah. those time management uh, needs are much less pressing uh, Usually, um, so it was a little bit of a vacation for me while also be feeling like its own full-time job. But yes. um, it depends. Filmmaking is nice because you you get to ramp up and then you get to ramp down. Typically, the production period is 24/7 for however long you're shooting the movie. But you know you have a nice pre-production period Anytime. to get used to that schedule, and then when you finish the movie, you have a nice period to kind of ease out of it as you're kind of figuring out all the post-production stuff. So I would say for a lot of my year, my schedule's pretty flexible and I can make my own hours and I'm a night owl naturally, so I tend to get a lot done at night. And um, But then when you are ready to make a movie, you just turn your life over to it. It becomes, and often I'm not even making the schedule. You know, there's producers yeah. and other people that are like, okay, look, we, if we want to shoot at this location, we have to get in there at 5 a.m. and we have to right. be out of there by 2 p.m. and that's the amount of time you have to shoot that right. scene. So there's no, and we can't get back in there tomorrow because we have to be on the other side mm -hmm. of town. Yeah. So that's where time management yeah, comes. Yeah, I think, I think that everything, what we all have in common is we all have a performance. Ah, yes. You know, right. we all have a deadline. We all have to get somewhere and the opening has to be there, whether it's a restaurant, a concert, a game, well, yeah, and you know, film. It, mm -hmm. We we do. It's performance. I, I think the other interesting piece is, especially when you're operating with a very small budget, if a budget at all, and you're basically trying to figure out how to not go bankrupt, is that your timeline is is reflective on that. And it, again, it goes back to your team. So, like, let's say, um, for example, we just shot the music video for the song I did, and we we have a, a featured artist that lives in Oklahoma, and he's going to be performing with me on November 6th, just opened for Leon Russell, some, some great artists. We knew we had one weekend with him, we had 48 hours, so we said, okay, great, um, you're going to come and record, and then we're going to shoot a 14-hour day oh. for a music video, Gosh. And, then, um, and then you'll leave. Like, and so the guy was here for 48 hours, he slept for six, and we did work the entire rest of the time. So working with people that are understanding and who believe in a project is very important. And, and to the chefs, you know, you need that support system when you don't have, when you can't throw money at people and say, do it for me because I'm paying you. This right, much. right. Yes, you um, have to get them in passion because yeah. there is no mm -hmm. money. I mean, usually. You want everyone to arrive at the same place at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yes, and how hard is that? So I have a question for all of you. I'll start with Chef, but um, 
You know, you're all so committed. And I always think that that's the difference between success and not success, is being committed. But I'm wondering, starting with Chef, have you ever doubted yourself? Because you've gone out there in the public, three restaurants now, and was there ever a point in time in any of your career, starting with Chef, when you thought, I'm just not sure? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's no question that anybody with whatever you're doing has, has, that, has that moment or has maybe even multiple times in your career where you question mm -hmm. If you're if you're good enough for it, or you know. Yes. I think you know. For me, I think having you know even even still now, not that this has anything to do with 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 being good enough, but I think you having have to a, hold your mic. Having okay. a <laughs> having a family with kids. Yes. And feeling like you don't you don't spend enough enough time with them, that's that's sure. different than not feeling like you're capable of the job. But I did I did actually work for for a chef um, here here in this in this lovely city, who. Um, who felt like maybe I should I should do something else? You know? <gasps> so I'm not going to mention the name of that chef. Oh, wow! And so and how do you get so, beyond that? Well, you know, I mean, I left that job. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you did. And, yes. And, and moved on and, and and rose to the to the next op opportunity. Absolutely. You know? How did you guys get over doubt? Because I think everyone at some point in time has had that feeling. Oh my God, I I, I think constantly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, did, did you put the right person in the right right role? You, yes. know, you spend hours and hours and hours bringing someone to a certain place, and you want them to deliver. And yeah. so I would say that for me, the hours between two a.m. and five a.m. are pretty troubling, yeah. and they're and they're often. Mm -hmm. Wow. You yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think. Well, it's part of. I almost feel like. You know, and people are like, oh, it's, you're lucky you have a passion. It's like, yeah, <laughs> sure, but sure I'm lucky. But I also like, the uh, before going to sleep every night, I think it's, I operate out of fear that I won't achieve my greatest dreams. Right. But at the same time. It propels you, that fear. It propels you, yeah. and also you end up meeting amazing people if mm -hmm. you're lucky along the way. Mm -hmm. And again, I go back to the support system. It's very important to have, you know, I'd be lost without my best friend. I mean, yeah. I've, she's known me I since, say the same since I was 18 years old. Yeah. And anytime I'm like, have a life crisis situation, yeah. she's there with me. Yeah. I was struggling up here for a minute, trying to get into the groove. Which had to look her in the eyes. We saw you. And she get had in my the back. Group. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the, you know, and, the, and that continues throughout life. And you're lucky if you have people that that get you. And and right now, I would say for all of us, um, in all of our fields, we're lucky to have people who are patrons of the arts, who come out and see shows, who are supportive of the arts. Raise our glass to patrons Truly. of the Heard arts. Yeah. Really. No, really, thank you everyone for patrons coming out, patrons of the arts. Absolutely. We're thankful to you. We are thankful we are. and grateful, and I'll drink to that. Absolutely. And I will too. How do you get over doubt, if you have any? Uh, definitely, I do all the time. I mean, I, you know. Drugs I'm, and alcohol? Yeah. <laughs> <Definitely>. Mostly. <laughs> it helps. Um, How did you know? I mean, one of the best things that I think can happen to any artist is to just fail a lot of times early on and realize it's that it's not the end of the world. I mean, yes. when you, you know, I think a lot of fear and doubt comes out of not knowing what's going to happen if it doesn't work. And so having the experience where it doesn't work and you realize it's you okay. You live to tell. Yeah, it's right? fine. Yeah. You just try again at a different time. Uh, allows you to, in a way, temper that fear, but it's been interesting. I mean, the older I get, I actually, the more I notice that I'm fearful of things. I think I've sort of lost oh, whatever that early wave of just like, well, I'm young and I have unlimited opportunities right. to fuck up. Now I don't feel like I have unlimited <laughs> opportunities to fuck up. Well, and so you have I'm, a baby, and that changes it too a little bit. That's been part of it. But I think <laughs> even without him, I just think I'm recognizing, I'm like, oh, okay, I only have so much time on this earth. Now what do I really want to do? Let's get serious about like yeah, what yeah. I really want to do. Right. And so I'm, you know, I'm dealing with my own internal ideas of success and my yes. own internal goals. And so it's not a crippling fear, and it's not a like a fear that you can't overcome. But it is, you know, there is a feeling of like, all right, we're really doing this. Like yes, I'm ten right. years into my career right now. And there's no How turning back. How do I back. want this thing to go? Right. Right. Which are not questions I used to ask myself. I used to be like, 
All right, cool. I finished that movie. Here's some people I'm excited about. I'll go Next. get that movie. Nothing to lose. Yeah. Let's keep just going. Like, let's, let's just sort of like keep that party going. And now I'm like, all right, I know what it means to get involved in a project now. I know this is going to be yes. 18 months of my life. Right. Who do I want to spend that 18 months with? Right. What story do I want and to tell? How do I want this cost. experience to be? And so the stakes seem to me to get higher and higher each time in a good way. Yes. In a way that's inspiring and, and but in a way that does, that is conducive to fear. Right, because and and, and, there's more on the line. Yeah, it feels to me like there's more on the line. Yeah, I think, I, and just to, to piggyback off that, I feel like it, at some point you say, all right, what's my legacy gonna be? You know, uh -huh. like, it's not even just about, oh, what am I gonna accomplish and how much money am I gonna make? And you know, like, it's not, I don't think it's anything su superficial like that, you know, in the art, artistic world, and all of our artistic worlds, I think it becomes how am I, going to, what's my impression that I'm leaving on the earth, and you know, how am I paying my rent for the space that I'm taking up on this earth? On earth. What are people going to say about me when I pass on, you know, and what's going to be my narrative? Yes. And that gets mm -hmm. scary the older you get, because it's like, all right, what am I going to have the opportunity cre to create? What projects can I create? And who's going to be on board with me for that? And that's... Frightening. Frightening. Yeah. Frightening. We but have exciting. A, but exciting. We have a tweet that's just come in, or a, a quick tweet or question that's just come in for chefs. Allie, what do we have? From Patty W. What are your inspirations for your cuisine? Ooh. Well, I will just say that Patty W. has won a hundred dollar gift certificate from our friends at Groupon to go to Perennial Verant. Lucky, yeah. lucky Patty, and she has won. And she has won that book. Preservation Kitchen, yeah, sign Preservation Kitchen. Looks Congratulations, good. Patty. So now I'm going to answer the question. <laughs> yes, please. Inspiration. You know, it's a lot of things, but for for me, it's it's uh, it could be a trip to the to the farmers market. Traveling is a huge. You know, when I when I have a chance to to go anywhere, you know, it could be a, a, a road trip or actually this week I'm I'm cooking in Richmond. And then I'm cooking in, in New York a week from tonight. So there's always a lot of ins, in, inspiration. You know, I'm looking forward to getting out kind of to the Ch Chesapeake Bay area. I'm ah. cooking at the Rappahannock Oyster Company cool. in Richmond. So traveling's huge. You know? Yes, right, getting ideas um, from other sources. But I, I, I think I, I find a lot of ins, in, inspiration also from having a chance to spend some, some, some time outside. You know, like whether it's a hike, uh -huh, you know, in nature. A walk with my kids, and you sort of, you know, and I've always been into into foraging, so it's kind of fun to, you know, to look for things that right. you can, you know, the wild edibles that you can find. And you've got mushroom season, right? Isn't this mushroom season is big? I mean, yeah. the the fall is probably the biggest biggest time of the year for for puffballs, head of the woods, shaggy mane, chicken of the woods, yeah. you know. Great. And then from, from out west, I mean, we get porcinis and matsutake mushrooms, so. Do you have a favorite ingredient in the kitchen? No, not, not favorite ingredient, favorite most ingredient? important. Can't live without ingredient in the kitchen? Salt's pretty important. <laughs> you know, so I used to say salt, and then I decided <laughs> onions. What could I really do without an onion? Just, you know, I think, I think seasoning or having the ability to season food is it's huge. I mean, you know, yeah. any, anything, you know, in, in its own in its own way, in its own form, can be tasty. But you know, salt really sort of help helps enhance the flavor of an item, whether it's asparagus or a tomato that's perfectly ripe with a little sprinkling of salt. You know, Hell yeah. so I mean, you know, many lives and, and wars have been fought over salt. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, I feel almost sacrilegious by asking you this because you you like to take hikes and you're talking about heirloom tomatoes and you know do you have a favorite junk food of course and what is it i mean I, you know I, I pretty much eat everything so i don't okay i know, feel better um, i can again <laughs> i mean my 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 son my youngest son for for uh for for Hall halloween this week is going to be fun dip you know the he wants to be candy. He's like a, wait, he he's like a full-on candy. Oh, so wait, wait, wait. Tell me again what he's going to you know, be. Remember the, the old candy it's fun the dip? Package, you know, the the different the flavored thing. packages yeah. and you get the stick that you It's delicious. Eat. So that's not my, that's, but I just, I'm, I'm bringing that up because what I that's his recommend. That's costume? That's what, he, that's what he's going to be this week for Halloween. <laughs> but I was encouraging, encouraging him to be snow caps. 
a big snow camp fan, you know? <laughs> Painted black, you know, flecked with white. You know? uh, what an easy costume. You're being very easy kind to your wife. Very costume. What about you guys? Favorite junk food down the line? Salty caramel. Ooh, yummy. That's almost nice. like a nice junk food. I, I can't get over cup of noodle soups. I know they're in styrofoam <laughs> containers. That's oh my God, is that, but they're is that so delicious. I was gonna say, I'm not even sure that's, like that's, that's, that's kind of food. No, it's soup, soup that, really isn't junk it's food. It's soup with like nine good. million grams of sodium. Yes, that's true. It's made in a, it's made in a it's styrofoam <laughs> thing. I, I love it though, it's, it's so bad. I just I think it's the most delicious ever. <laughs> How about you? Um, I'm an ice cream person. Mm. Uh, that sort of uh, all, will always be uh, the vice for me. I just can't seem to go too many days without it. What's your flavor? I don't, you know, I'm like probably a mint chip person yeah. if I had to, if it like got broken. Give out. it up! That is completely I'm, mainstream. I wouldn't have thought you'd yeah. go mint chip. Um, and also, you know, in terms of Halloween, we, we talked about it earlier, uh, gender and changing times, but I just want to say, you know, my four-year-old son is going as Elsa from Frozen. <laughs> that, when I was that age, there was not a female character that be. I would have right. wanted to be for Halloween. <laughs> yes. And I think it's amazing, actually, yes. that he... Where he put on the dress, he's got a blonde wig, and he feels so powerful in that outfit. I think it's incredible. I want to see a picture I, of your son. I knew that. Was, yeah, it I was want amazing. To see, I want to see that picture, both of your kids, actually. I want to see those pictures. So we actually have a, a tweet or a question for the whole group. Allie, what do, we, what do we have? From Jason Lovell, all guests are in creative fields. How do you develop your unique personal style, and how does it influence your work today? Ooh, how do you develop your unique personal style and how does it influence your work today? I will say that Jason has won a Kendall College cookbook and a huge Staub cookware um, thing. Th thank you. <laughs> yes. So you can get to cooking. I love that question. One more time, Allie. Tell me the question again. Unique style. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to repeat it? Yes, sure. The whole yes for everyone. How do you develop your unique style? No, first yep. there, bro. All guests are in creative fields. How do you develop your unique style, and how does it influence your work today? And how does it? Influence I think that you're true to yourself and yes. not to what you're confronted with every day. I think you 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 take uh, uh, the temperature of yourself and how you feel, and and that becomes kind of you have to own you have to own it. You you. you you can manufacture it, you can copy, but it's not the same. I absolutely think that those are the best words of advice. You have to be true to yourself, absolutely. Mm -hmm. What about you, Sammy? Well, I agree, I agree that, um, I would, you know, my North Star as far as writing music and, and um, in my life in general is something Janis Joplin said once, which was, they said, why do you think your music's so relevant to young people? And she said, I just think they don't want to be lied to, man. <laughs> and and I really I really vibe with that. I think that's really important. You know, on any given day, I can be inspired. Like, let's say I go to the ballet, and I'm inspired by something there, and it makes me it awakens something in my head, and I have to write about it. I think the most important thing is yeah, the truth coming and out, especially yes. in a time right now where there's a lot of stuff flying around, and we don't know where information is coming mm -hmm. from. I think it's right, important yeah. for us to ask those questions and. Um, for us, because we have a huge responsibility as artists and um, people who build culture, to be as truthful as possible. Yes, yes. What about you, Chef? I have no idea. Lay it down. No, I. I mean, I. You know, I, I agree obviously with what what they're saying. I mean, it, it's it's a lot of it has a lot to do with, you know, what sort of you set out to be, what mm -hmm. what kind of goals you set. Um, you know, I think. Ultimately, you need to sort of evolve with the with the times as well. You know, you need to sort of you have your particular style for me. You know, style of cooking, but you have to embrace other things that come along. Your staff, you know, other things that might that might that might that might inspire you to change something. So, but you know, being honest with with yourself and 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 going for it. I yes. think is, is key. Just going for it. I love these. These are all sort of words of advice that you're landing on for everyone. You, sir. 
I mean, I have found often to my chagrin that I can't not be myself, <laughs> which... Yes, there really uh, is no other choice. You know, there's like many times where I'm like, wow, I'm going to really do this different this time. <laughs> And then I finish a project, and I'm like, well, it's one of my movies again. <laughs> now I can't break out of that. So I think that you, there is some internal thing that you're sort of never going to escape, and you might as well embrace it, because yes. it's not going to go away no matter how hard you try. But I do think that a, per, you know, a personal style can become as much a trap as it is uh, you know, and, and something that's advantageous for an artist. So I think as long as you're always trying to do something different, You'll end up, Growing. it'll end up coming back to who you are as an artist and sort of what your vision is. But I do think it's important not to get comfortable in that space because I, I do see a lot of artists who I think don't age very well because they realize too early what their thing is and then they spend a lot of time just doing that. Thing. And then they so, stay so there. Really yes. Through. I'd love to end on these words of advice because the fact is you're never going to be any better than yourself. So the sooner you accept that, then the faster you are at being great at yourself, which is ideally what you really want to be. I want to thank all of you for coming because you've been such an attentive audience. Usually by this time, people are like making noise with their rappers and things, but you guys have been so wonderfully attentive. You've been a great audience. I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank all of the people at City Winery. entire team, really wonderful. I want to thank Ashley Weider, Artistic thank Director you. of Jeff yeah. Sammy Grisabi, football player, female extraordinaire, our wonderful chef Paul Moran for giving us such a great show. And can I have your book, please? Now, I know we have Halloween, and then we have Thanksgiving, but let's face it, we have Christmas, it's coming down the line. This is a fantastic Christmas gift, and he can sign it. So um, it's a beautiful book. Just, just, it's so informative, but it's also beautiful inside. So he's going to be here signing books. I would like to thank Joe Swanberg for finding the time, writing the emails, for coming here. If you think that was fun, and let's face it, it was. It's fun and informative, and you get to eat, and you're winning things. I mean, what could be better? The next dinner party is December 1st. We have New York Times best-selling author Rebecca Skloot. She wrote The um, Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, so she's going to be here. It's very exciting. We have beloved theater critic Chris Jones, and we have famed uh, improv improviser, actor David Pasquese, whom I'm sure you know. Oh, yes, he's great. He's a genius. And then, oh, he's he a really genius. Is. And our chef is going to be Chris Pandell of the Bristol and Belena. Yes, nice. So that's going to be our show December 1st. I hope you come back. Get your tickets. They go on sale on Thursday. My name is Elizabeth Alfano. Let me leave you with one last bit of information. You're now all comfortable with your index cards. If you have any comments that you want to let me know about the show, things you want to see differently, all this kind of stuff, leave me your name and email. Leave the cards on the table. Write me your comments. I will look at them. It's been great having you here. Thank you so much for coming tonight, everybody. See you December 1st.